Hello everybody, welcome. We're very happy to welcome you once more to the pavilion, but also a very nice and warm welcome to the people watching from home. My name is David Boere, and together with my colleagues here at Studium Generala, I organize all kinds of lectures, film screenings, workshops, and more, from popular movie screenings to philosophical lectures about popular movies. We do it all. You take the blue pill, the story ends. You wake up in your bed, and you believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I'll show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. This famous quote from the first Matrix movie has almost started living a life of its own. Are we truly living in a simulation? What can the Matrix tell us about this? And what influence has the Matrix had on the world around us? These and more questions will be addressed tonight by Professor Dr. Jos de Mil. Jos de Mil is Professor of Philosophical Anthropology at Erasmus School of Philosophy, and his work focuses on philosophical anthropology, philosophy of art and culture, and the philosophy of information and communication technologies. Besides this, he's also a big Matrix fan, so we're in good hands tonight. Please give a warm welcome to Jos de Mil. Good evening, all, or good afternoon, I must say. It's still early. Um, <clears throat> the Matrix, who hasn't seen it? Uh, this iconic dystopian science fiction film released in 1999 about the future world in which humanity is unknowingly trapped inside a simulated reality, a neural interactive simulation, as it is called. The other name for it is The Matrix, a system which intelligent machines have created to distract humans while their bodies are held captive in embryonic pods, a kind of battery cages as an energy source for the machines. As befits a Hollywood movie, the film has a male hero, Neo, who escapes from his prison with the help of a group of rebels, led by the prophetic Morpheus. Neo frees humanity from its shackles and at the same time conquers the heart of his fellow warrior, Trinity. In sum, a hero who brings everything to a successful conclusion. Moreover, the film combines a whole range of genres. It is not only a science fiction film and a love story, but also a Hong Kong action movie, a thriller and a mystery as well, held together by a gloomy dark green aesthetic and spectacular visual effects, such as bullet time, a combination of slow motion while the camera appears to move through the scene at normal speed. The movie is written and directed by the brothers Larry and Andy Wachowski. By now, I should say Wachowski sisters, because the siblings both came out as trans women in, in 2012 and 2016, and are known since then as Lana and Lily Wachowski. The Matrix was an instant success. The movie earned a five, a 465 million dollars worldwide on a budget of 65 million. Two sequels, The Matrix Reloaded and The Matrix Revolutions followed in 2003, as well as animated movies, computer games and comics. And last but not least, a cartload of learned studies by famous philosophers, such as Hubert Dreyfus, who, by the way, in 2000 uh, got an honorary doctorship at the Erasmus University, David Chalmers and Slavoj Cicek. In addition, fans of, Matrix, of the Matrix saga maintain dozens of fanzines, websites and wikis. 20 years later, The Matrix is generally regarded as one of the best science fiction films of all time comparable to Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, where the battle between humans and artificial intelligence is also a central theme. In 2019, 20th after its premiere, Warner Bros. released a gloriously remastered version of the movie. And although the reviews of the two sequels were not particularly well received by the critics, and also commercially less successful, Warner Bros. also announced that there will be a fourth installment of the Matrix saga. The US premiere of The Matrix 4, entitled The Matrix Resurrections, was December 22. 
It was uh, originally um, the date worldwide, but because of the corona pandemics, the Dutch premiere was postponed until January 26. I'm wondering who of you already seen the movie? Can you raise your hand? Well, only one person so far, and here one on the first row, I know. <laughs> so that's, um, well, I <coughs> maybe you are, um, you have plans to watch the movie in the cinema, so I will be uh, sparing with spoilers, although it's unavoidable to unveil some elements of the plot, I'm afraid. Great works of art have many layers and evoke various interpretations. In the case of The Matrix, this is even more so than usual. The abundance of artistic, religious and philosophical references makes The Matrix, as Slavoj Cicek has noted, a kind of Rorschach test to which everyone can give their own interpretations. The Matrix has been interpreted as a Marxist critique of the role of culture industry in neoliberal capitalism, as a tech nerd fantasy on the emergence of a global brain or hive mind, as a psychoanalytical investigation in the role of fantasies, and as a plea for Eastern techniques of emptying your mind and spiritual enlightenment. And because of the bewildering mix of genres and the abundance of cultural references, for example, to the white rabbit we know from Lewis Carroll's um, Alice in Wonderland, and also from the famous psychedelic pop song by Jefferson Airplane, the movie has also been interpreted as a textbook case of postmodernist cutting and pasting in the arts. However, without doubt, the key idea of the movie is that the world we live in is a simulation. This was not a strikingly original idea, as it is central to quite a few films from the late 19th. Uh, the Truman Show, for example, um, in which the main character is um, trapped in a reality show, is a uh, famous example, just like uh, Dark City, in which the fake world is created by aliens. And the world as a computer or game simulation uh, made by an evil genius is also depicted in movies like Total Recall, uh, Recall and Existence. Moreover, the idea that the world may be a simulation is not only subject for fiction. In science and philosophy, the team has been addressed as well. Since Nick Bostrom published his article, Are We Living in a Computer Simulation? in the Philosophical Quarterly, four years after the premiere of the first Matrix movie, and in the same year applied the simulation argument also to the Matrix movie in his contribution to the edited volume, The Matrix and Philosophy, there has been a lively debate on this topic. And the question is not only if it is possible that the universe is a gigantic computer, but also if this is the case, what are the implications? Must there also be a kind of divine programmer, a god or a superior intelligence from outer space? Somewhat similar to the divine watchmaker that was supposed to exist according to Descartes, Newton and other scientists and philosophers living in the 17th century in the time that the emergence of machines stimulated the mechanization of the worldview. Or is it rather the case that the clock and the computer did came about just by themselves, by a mechanism or algorithm like natural selection? Anyway, both the mechanistic and the informationistic worldview presuppose that the universe can only be described adequately in the language of mathematics. In 2020, astronomer David Kipling of Columbia University calculated with the help of Bayesian reasoning that the chances that we are indeed living in a simulation are about 50%. Moreover, almost 20 years before the premiere of the first Matrix movie, philosopher Hilary Putnam explored the possibility that all sentient beings are brains in a vat, hooked up to one another through a powerful computer, which creates our experiences so that these do not arise 
from sensory perception of a real world, but from a simulation by a machine. Although Putman's reflections on brains in a vat have been inspired by the invention of the computer, they are actually variants of age-old thought experiments. For example, in his, media uh, in his meditations, <coughs> published in 1641, Descartes already wondered whether an evil demon conjures up a false world to us. I was thinking, is it possible that some demon creates a world and puts it in my mind, uh, and so that the world is a gigantic illusion? And 25 centuries uh, ago, Plato already compared our com perception to that of prisoners in a cave, who hold projections on the rock face for the real world. And Christianity, <coughs> according to Nietzsche, Platonism for the people, varies on this. The kingdom of Christ is not of this world. The kingdom is a true and eternal world, a metaphysical and spiritual world, located beyond the illusionary and transient physical world as it is experienced through our senses. The matrix stands therefore in a very long metaphysical tradition. Not surprisingly, in the third part of the trilogy, The Matrix Revolutions, Neo ends at the cross of light, the source code of all what is, both in the real world and in the world of appearances. He sacrifices himself in order to rescue the world of the humans and the world of the machines from the destructive power of evil embodied by Agent Smith, a derailed computer program developed to control the matrix. So a real Christian ending eh, on the cross. Quite a few comment, uh, commentators express disappointment at this Christian ending of what first appeared to be a revolutionary new worldview, just as Nietzsche was very disappointed by at, the, at the time with the suspiciously Christian turn that the previously revolutionary Wagner made in his opera Parsifal, eh, also one who started as a revolutionary and ended as a Christian. However, the question is whether this disappointment with the end of the Matrix trilogy was fully justified. Quite a few elements in the Matrix, for example, contradict the Platonic and Christian interpretations. In the movie, the true world is far from being a Platonic or Christian world. In this metaphysical tradition, the true world is the immaterial world, the world of the spirit. However, in the Matrix, it's exact opposite. After all, whereas the prison world of the Matrix is completely immaterial, a sheer simulation in the mind of the human prisoners, the true world to which Neo and the other rebels has have, have escaped turned out to be, oh irony, an utmost material world located in a gigantic cave deep in uh, the earth. In the Matrix reboots, uh, if the Matrix reboots the metaphysical world view of Plato and Christianity, it is a reboot with a radical twist. It puts the Platonic and Christian worldview upside down. The more because the true world is by no means a paradise. The rebels living in the darkness of the cave have to keep themselves alive with disgusting food and are permanently threatened by sentinels, murderous machines aiming at the elimination of humans who escape from their pods. That's why the character Cypher, the Judas who betrays Neo for a juicy virtual stick, wonders, just like the philosopher Robert Nutzik, whether living in a perfect simulation would not be preferable to a real life full of hardship and pain. However, although the Matrix reverses the order and evaluation, it appears to stick to the opposition of a true and an apparent world. Differently interpreted, but the structure is the same. Or is this impression incorrect? Although the first Matrix movie is full of references to philosophical, philosophical ideas, there is only one philosopher who is quoted explicitly. In the beginning of the film, Neo is still trapped in the Matrix and spends his virtual life 
as a computer programmer for a respectable software company called Meta Cortex. However, in the evening, he also sells pirated software. He hides his digital drugs and money in a hollowed book, which turns out to be a copy of the English translation of Simulacre et Simulation, published in 1981 by the French postmodern philosopher Jean Baudrillard. When Neo opens the book, we see not only floppy disks and banknotes, but also the title of the final chapter of the book, Sur le nihilisme, on nihilism. This reference to Baudrillard is not an isolated one. After Neo is freed from the Matrix by rebels, led by Morpheus, he must choose between the blue pill and the red pill, which keep him trapped in the matrix, or the red pill, the one uh, which will show him the true world. When he has swallowed the red one, Morpheus shows him on a television screen the skyline of a, um, of a uh, ruined city, in which we see the blackened twin towers. A prophetic gift cannot be denied Morpheus. It's two years before 9-11. When Neo starts at the image in shock, Morpheus quotes a famous line from Baudrillard's book. At the moment, Morpheus shows the post-apocalyptic skyline of New York with the ruins of the Twin Towers. Welcome to the desert of the real. The actors playing the, in The Matrix had to read Simulacra and, uh, and Simulation in preparation to their roles. However, Baudrillard was not amused at all. In an interview following the premiere of The Matrix Reloaded in 2003, Baudrillard told Le Nouvel Observateur that the Wachowski brothers had repeatedly asked him to act as an advisor, but that he declined the invitation because, in his view, the makers misinterpreted his work completely. They confused the problem that postmodern simulation presents with the classic Platonic and Christian distinction between the true and the apparent world. By showing the world of the matrix and the real world as two different worlds, the creators are ignoring the hallmark of the age of simulation. This very distinction between the real and the apparent world has disappeared, according to Baudrillard. It is thus not a simple reversal, a putting upside down of the classical metaphysical distinction, but a twisting out of this opposition. Here we heard the echo of the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, the grandfather, uh, the grandfather of postmodern philosophers like Baudrillard. According to Nietzsche, not only the true world of the spirit of Plato and Christianity is a big lie, but with the abolition of the true world, the whole distinction between true and apparent becomes obsolete. Although after the death of God, we still cling to secular idols, political and technological grand narratives and utopias that promise future salvation, think about fascism, communism, but also technological utopias, as we find uh, with people like uh, Elon Musk, for example. According to Nietzsche, these echoes of the dead god will soon lose their spell. After the decline of Marxism, neoliberalism, and their invisible hand, prob probably is the last of these grand narratives. But according to Nietzsche, when also these last um, idols will vanish, we have to face the fact that, the li that our life is full of strife and suffering with no hope of a metaphysical salvation, neither in a world beyond our world or in a distant future located. In the world after the death of God, nihilism rules, according to Nietzsche. And uh, for that reason, the last chapter on, in the book of Baudrillard is also called On Nihilism. And there we find this Nietzschean inspiration clearly expressed. For the neo-Nietzschean Baudrillard, simulation is the last stage in the history of imitation. In the first stage, the copy, for example, a painted portrait like the Mona Lisa, 
doubles reality, but mainly refers <coughs> to the original, <coughs> the woman painted. In the second stage, brilliantly analyzed by the German philosopher Walter Benjamin in his famous 1936 essay, uh, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, characterized by media like photo and film, the copy is gradually becoming more prominent and even outflanking the original. In iconic photographs such as those of Marilyn Monroe, there is still an original, but it is almost hidden from view by the countless copies they are doing around. And actually, you might say, the, the copy is becoming more important than the original. And in the third stage, the stage of simulations, digital <coughs> simulations described by Boudrillard, the simulated, the simulated work, world of computer games, of virtual reality and fake news, an original whole is altogether missing. Uh, it is even impossible to speak of copies. <coughs> they are copies without an original, or as Boudrillard calls them, simulacra. Uh, so simulacra are copies that have no original. According to Boudrillard, postmodern culture is full of such simulacra. Disneyland is a textbook example. The characters we encounter do not refer to actual characters, but to fantasy figures. Moreover, Disneyland functions as an ideology that propagates the American way of life. And above all, Disneyland should suggest that there is also a real America outside the park, when in fact all of America has become Disneyfied, has become one big Disney park. The media no longer show as reality, they have become, according to Boudrillard, instruments that make reality disappear, or even destroy reality. That especially became clear in a number of articles uh, Boudrillard wrote about uh, the Gulf War. Behind, <coughs> the <t> <coughs> <pardon> Behind the TV images of the precision bombing that supposed to convince us that a clear war is going on in Iraq, Boudrillard writes at, the, at that time that there are, that they are only are remnants of reality. Cities shot in ruins, full of corpses, uh, full of dead people. And then his conclusion is a uh, welcome in the desert of the real, uh, of the remnants of the real. In the hyper-real world of the media, however, these last vestiges of a painful reality also evaporate. And the whole distinction between appearance and reality, between truth and untruth, good and evil, beauty and ugliness has disappeared. It means, as Boudrillard writes in the final chapter of Simulacre et Simulation, in that chapter on nihilism, the victory of the other nihilism, of an other terrorism, the terrorism of the system, which has the power to pour everything, including what denies it, into indifference. In this simulated hyperreality, there seems to be no place for Neoplatonic heroes like Neo, and no place for happy endings a la Hollywood. Is Boudrillard's criticism of the, Wachow uh, of the Wachowskis justified? Not completely, in my view. Surely, the more or less happy ending of the trilogy seems to compromise to the Hollywood ideology. But there are many elements in the trilogy that suggest that the Wachowskis did understand Boudrillard quite well. At countless points, the stories of the distinction between the Matrix world and the real world is questioned in the movies. This already becomes clear in the first Matrix movie. Why does Morphe Morpheus, when he introduces Neo to the desert of the real, not show him reality itself, but an image on a television screen? This is the scene in which he shows the desert of the real. It is not there anymore. Especially in The Matrix Reloaded and The Matrix Revolutions, the two sequels, the distinction between the real world and the Matrix increasingly gets blurred. 
whoever is killed in the matrix also dies in the real world. According to Morpheus, because the body cannot live without the mind. Another clue is that Neo learns to use his supernatural skills he, had, he develops in the Matrix, like stopping bullets with his thoughts and flying through the Matrix. In, um, in these two uh, sequels, he learns to use these skills in the real world, in the real world as well. In the Matrix Reloaded, for example, in his fight against the Sentinels that come to destroy Zion, and the world in which the rebels hide, uh, there we see that he is able also in the real world to stop the bullets. And finally, in the Matrix Revolutions, the oracle that leads Neo to, the, to his goal helps him to discover all of this. What he learns is that the real and the simulated work, world turn out to have the same source code. So there is actually, also in the Matrix movies, no difference between living in a real world and living in a simulation. And perhaps this is already implied in the very title of the film. After all, the word matrix refers both to the uterus and to a mathematical grid that underlies computer simulations. And so the real world and the simulated world are referred to with the same name, matrix. And it gradually becomes clear that the idea of a true world beyond the world we inhibit is an illusion. But it is an illusion without which people cannot live. Without such illusions, people fall into despair. Neo himself turns out to be an anomaly built into the system, an outlet for the freedom-hungry human being. Neo's death on the cross is not unique. The architect of the Matrix tells Neo that he actually is the sixth savior of humanity, in each cycle merging with the machine world, after which the entire system is rebooted and the cycle starts again. A process that brings Nietzsche's idea of the Erika Wiedergeer des Gleichen to mind. What at first appears to destroy the system turns out to be an essential element of its continuation. And this is also entirely in line with Boudrillard's statement, God is not dead, but he has become hyper-real. When the nouvelle, uh, nouvelle Observateur journalist notes that the Matrix, like many Hollywood productions, is presented as a critique of the system when it is its very product, Boudrillard says, that is, exactly, that is exactly what makes our time so oppressive. The system integrates negativity into its spectacles as aging is built into industrial products. The Matrix, without doubt, is the type of film about the Matrix that the Matrix could produce. But isn't that exactly what the Matrix shows us and thus reveals Boudrillard in rivals Boudrillard in cynicism. The Matrix and its two sequels are even more topical and realistic now than it was in 1999. Although we are not yet locked in one big simulated world, humanity is glued to screens, addicted to hyper-realities which, in which the system immerses us. With the presidency of Donald Trump, from his this was the largest audience to ever witness an inauguration period, both in person and around the globe, to stop the steal, we saw a steep rise of fake news and fake videos that for many citizens have completely blurred the distinction between the real and the apparent world. And as shown by Cassie J in her 1916 documentary, The Red Pill, about the anonymous online community of the same name, where insults, involuntary celibates, mostly deprived young white males unable to find a sexual partner, blaming feminists and feminist theories for that, exchange their often rather toxic views about women and sometimes even promote violence against them, the red pill has transformed from a fictitious entry to the true world, to the name of a social network that has driven 
conspiracy theories to a new level. Red pilling, opening oneself or others to hard counterintuitive truths, has become the symbol of all those who have stopped believing in science, flat earthers, conspiracy theorists, anti vaxxers, uh, wappies, and other more or less dangerous extremists, uh, extremists. And this is only part of the dystopian realization of the Matrix, where the system in the movie uses humanity as an energy source, big tech companies like Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft and Google are sucking all information out of us and are already experimenting <coughs> with artificial intelligence directly linking brains to the internet. <coughs> If Mark Zuckerberg's wet dream of the metaverse comes true, the Wachowski brothers' 1999 prophecy of the Matrix will be fully realized. And even the idea that superior machines will dominate us <coughs> has, in our 2022 world, increasingly inhabited by robots and artificial intelligence, turned from a sheer thought experiment into a realistic scenario. If we may believe the prophecies of physicists <coughs> like uh, Stephen Hawking, philosophers like Mac, uh, Max Bock Bostrom, and entrepreneurs like Elon, Elon Musk, who advises his followers on Twitter to take the red pill, my fears are somewhat different, but probably even more frightening, because, in my opinion, the chances are greater that we will dominate it by or will merge with inferior machines instead of superior ones. Should we, following <coughs> Neo and Morpheus, resist our fusion with the machines at all costs? When we revisit the Matrix 20 years after its premiere, it is parti particularly striking that the rebels are not only fighting software agents, but are killing innocent civilians too in the name of the illusion of the true world. The uncanny question that the happy ending of the Matrix, Neo's fusion with the machines, confronts us with 20 years after the premiere is whether it is not time to em embrace some form of happy cynicism. When 2000, in 2019 I read the announcement that the production of uh, a Matrix 4 movie has been started, I wrote an article in the national newspaper Trau, in which I tried to predict the title and the plot of the fourth movie. As to the title, I predicted that the title would be The Matrix Rebooted. And I also wrote that I wouldn't be surprised if in part four, Neo would opt for the blue pills instead of the red ones. <coughs> and to be honest, my expectations about the movie were not very high. In the last of the three reviews I wrote in 2003 about the Matrix trilogy, a trilogy, I wrote that the last of the three realized a new level of cinematographic decline. However, the Matrix Resurrections did not fully confirm my expectation. Certainly, Neo is swallowing many blue pills in the movie. And reboots play a crucial role in the plot. But I was wrong about the title <coughs> and by an uh, unexpected twist in the plot. And unlike many reviewers, after watching the movie for two times, I also was more positive about its cinematographic and philosophical qualities. But in order to convince you about that, I have to purple pill you. And let me try this in the last part of my talk. At first glance, Lana Warkowski and her co-authors faced a difficult task when Warner Bros. decided to release a fourth part of the Matrix saga. As with the classical tragedies, the Matrix trilogy leads to a closure. It's a closed-off story. Or as Agent Smith formulates it in the last part of the trilogy, everything that has a beginning has an end. After all, Neo and Trinity, the two heroes of the Matrix saga, were killed at the end, which makes a sequel not immediately obvious. After all, 
uh, sorry, uh, obvious. Prior to the premiere, a whole discussion among Matrix fans arose on the internet about what to expect. Some expect it would be a prequel, a tried and tested form in Hollywood when it comes to milking a successful franchise a little bit longer. The reason I assumed it was going to be a reboot was based on what we have learned about the history of the Matrix in the trilogy. In the first part, we learned from di the dialogue between Agent Smith and the captured Morpheus that the current Matrix was not the first one. Smith tells Morpheus that the first Matrix was designed as an utopia, engineered to make everyone happy. It was a disaster, says Agent Smith. People wouldn't accept the program and entire crops were lost. Some believed, continues Smith, that we lacked the programming language to describe the perfect world for humans. But I believe that, as a species, human beings define their reality through misery and suffering. The perfect world was a dream that your primitive cerebrum kept trying to wake up from, which is why the Matrix was redesigned again. And in the Matrix Reloaded, in the Matrix Reloaded, the architect explains that even five versions preceded the current one. The second version, in which misery and suffering ruled, also turned out to be unlivable for humans, eh, as we were told already in the first Matrix. But um, that also turns out for the following ones. The Oracle, an intuitive program initially created to investigate the psyche of humans, discovered by chance that the humans have to be given freedom of choice. Unlike computer programs, the human mind is able to bend and break the rules that govern them. Without this faculty and the accompanying hope for change, humans cannot survive their misery and suffering. However, according to the architect, who also seems to know Gödel's incompleteness theorems, and this freedom cannot be explained, and this freedom cannot be explained or predicted by the algorithms the, the matrix is built from. It is an anomaly. Right? It is a contradiction within the system. Within a system that is completely governed by rules, freedom cannot exist. So if it's there, it's an anomaly, it's a, a contradiction. And this leads in inevitably to crashes. Therefore, over time, the operating system should be updated and the matrix restarted completely. According to the architect, he's getting better and better at making the system error-proof, but he's not there yet. And that's why e Neo must return to the source. He had to sacrifice himself so that a seventh update can be installed and the matrix can be rebooted again. Such a reboot and update of an operating system after a system crash is essentially different from a reload, where an identical copy of a crashed program is retrieved from the computer's memory. In the case of a reboot, there is a repetition, but a repetition with a difference. And when it's an upgrade, it's not exactly the same program anymore. And here is that the Nietzsche's, and uh, here it is that Nietzsche's ID of the Ewige Wiedergeer des Gleichen is interesting. Because it is often wrongly translated in English. It's often translated as eternal recurrence, recurrence of the same, meaning that history consists of an eternal series of identical copies. But the German Gleichen is not the same as the same. Dasselbe in German. A more adequate translation would be eternal, eternal recurrence of the equivalent or eternal recurrence of the similar. It means that the historical events repeat themselves but also with a twist, with a difference. And for Nietzsche, the theorem of eternal recurrence is not so much an ontological statement about how the world is, but it is rather a moral principle for him. Act in such a way that you might wish that your action would be repeated forever. A repeat 
what's good for you and do it better each time. If we would translate Nietzsche's theorem of the eternal recurrence of the same, this would include, exclude, ex sorry, this would exclude the freedom to differ. Eternal recurrence of, sim of the similar reconciles faith and freedom. Although it is our fate to repeat history, uh, all human lives repeat earlier lives of other people, we have the freedom to repeat it in our own way. In a sense, this is precisely the core of Greek tragedy, so admired by Nietzsche. Fate is not something that simply happens to us, such as a tsunami, tsunami or an infection, but it is something the tragic hero brings about himself in freedom. Well, in the case of Corona, you could have an interesting discussion whether this is like a tsunami, something that just happens to us, or something created by ourselves, for example, by the globalization and the, and the permanent exchange of, uh, of goods and people and ideas, uh, which make that uh, a pandemic like this, uh, the one we are facing now, is possible. And then you could call it a tragedy and not a disaster. Fate is not something that just happens to us in tragedies, but something we bring about ourselves in freedom. And therein lies the ambiguity of man. Fate and freedom are not binary, mutually exclusive oppositions, like the ones and the zeros in a computer program. But both are true at the same time. And as such, an absurd anomaly in nature. It is probably therefore that in the time of the ancient Greeks, the performance of a tragic trilogy in a festival ended with a comedy as a kind of relief. And in the 19th century, Karl Marx notes that even historical events occur twice, but the first time as a tragedy and the second time as a farce. And to me, it is no coincidence that Morpheus, who quoted Baudrillard at his first meeting with Neo in the first part of The Matrix, in The Matrix Resurrections, quotes this statement of Marx at his, uh, when he meets Neo for the first time. A kind of grotesque meeting in a toilet. First as a tragedy, now as a farce. Because that is exact exactly what happens in the Matrix Resurrections. It reprises the tragic trilogy, but this time in the form of a comedy. Seen in this light, the discussion whether the Matrix Resurrections is a sequel or a reboot is misleading. It is rather, as Michael Kennedy puts in his review, a reboot call. And as we will see, the Matrix Resurrections radicalizes Baudrillard's simulacra and simulations, and at the same time pokes fun at it. Because The Matrix Resurrections ends in a romantic comedy, it is about love and it ends well. However, it is a happy ending with a tragic undertone. If we have to choose a genre designation for The Matrix Resurrections, then tragic comedy would be the most appropriate. At first glance, the Matrix Resurrections repeats the first part from 1999. Thomas Anderson, the future Neo, is once again unknowingly locked up in his embryonic pot and at the same time lives his life in the simulated matrix, in the simulated work world of the Matrix. Yet there is an important difference. Whereas in the first movie he was a kind of loser, a young software designer with a boring job at a big tech company who earned some additional money from the sale of pirated software, now he is the designer of successful computer games. In the first scene in which we get to see Thomas Anderson, we see him at work in his office, fairly luxury office this time compared to the cube in which he was working in the first movie. Um, and we see that um, he is particularly successful as a game uh, de developer. Um, the camera glides past the awards he won 20 years earlier as the designer 
of an acclaimed virtual reality computer game called The Matrix. With two successful sequels, we also see numerous franchise items, such as a plastic Trinity dolls. Despite the success, Thomas looks rather depressed. The new computer game he's working on, which bears the name Binary, another pun given the critique of binary oppositions of the true and the apparent world, does not want to go very smoothly. It's far over the budget and he's not really happy about the game at all. The self-mockery drips off the movie. The entire Matrix saga from the three previous films turn out now not have taken place in reality at all. They are nothing but a computer simulation of a commercial kind, a computer game with some sequels. A simulation within <laughs> a lot of uh, Droster effects. It's a simulation in a simulation in a simulation. The company where Neo works, it's called Deus, uh, Deus Ex Machina, it's also a pun, it's the name of the artificial intelligence in the previous three movies. Um, this um, This work in, in this uh, company, um, and the fact that it's depicted that way in the movie, completely seems to endorse Baudrillard's analysis of late capitalist society and his previously quoted critique of the Matrix film trilogy. And the Matrix is without doubt the type of film about the Matrix that the Matrix could produce. Well, it's the kind of game uh, it can produce. And the fun is, of course, that several games were produced after the success of the movies as well. Thomas completely seems to subscribe to that opinion. When he is complimented on his successes by his younger colleagues, he says gloomily, yeah, we, keep, we kept some kids entertained. It reminds me of Nirvana's song Teen Spirit. Here we are now, entertainers. Neo's dissatisfaction becomes especially clear when it turns out that Warner Bros the owner of Deus Ex Machina decides that there should be a sequel to the successful computer game. Hilarious scenes ensure in which an increasingly desperate Thomas meets with people from the marketing development, who presents him reports on focus groups, key associations with the brand, the top two being originality and freshness, and um, we also hear his younger colleagues brainstorm about the content of the sequel. We need guns, lots of guns. Mindless action is not on brand. Matrix is mind porn. Philosophy in shiny time PVC. IDs are the new sexy. The Matrix is about trans politics. It's about crypto fascism. It's a metaphor of capitalist exploitation. The fictitious world of the movie and the real world of the film production seems to melt together. The hilarious scenes can be read as a critical commentary on Warner Bros. Which, against the wishes of the Wachowski sisters, decided that there should be a fourth part of the Matrix franchise. With or without the Wachowskis. And so if they decline to uh, direct the movies, um, another director would be appointed. In the end, Lana turned out to be prepared, after which the unavoidable struggles followed about a scenario. The comment about trans politics is also a step under the water to Warner Bros. refusal in the film to let a character change gender uh, in his switches between the virtual world and the Matrix a gender switch that the Wachowskis made themselves in 2012 and 2016 in reality. So what was not possible in the movie was possible in reality, finally. Of course, with Baudrillard, we can note that the criticism depicted in the film still illustrates exactly Baudrillard's point that the system incorporates criticism and thus neutralizes it although that applies also to the work of Baudrillard and other academics, of course. 
they also criticize the system and are maintained by the system. And we have to admit that Barkovsky and Reeves eventually gave in to the millions of dollars offered by Warner Brothers. And when they would be in again. And despite of the self-critical first half of the film, we also have to admit, in the second half, we see a kind of repetition of those elements that made the first three movies so popular. Uh, being in his embryonic pot, escaped, uh, freed by Morpheus, and fight against software programs that control and destroy the enemies of the Matrix. However, it is a repetition with a difference again. Thomas' depressive feelings have an additional reason. He is haunted by nostalgic images, shots from the earlier parts of the trilogy, of which he does not know whether they are factually memories or whether they are runaway fantasies evoked by his work as a designer of virtual realities. For example, Tiffany, a woman he meets in the coffee shop, Simulata, also what's in the name, evokes confusing memories of the heroine Trinity from the computer game. And actually, that's not that strange, because it's the same actress. Thomas consults a therapist who diagnoses his repeated confusions as psychotic seizures and prescribes him a generous do daily dose of blue pills as medication. In a shot in which he takes his daily portion, we see on the label the name of the drug, it is ontolofloxin, yet another pun. Floxin is a well-known drug for bacterial infections, which has as side effects confusion, agitation, paranoia, hallucinations, memory problems, and troubles with concentrating, even suicidal thoughts. Well, if you see the number of blue pills he, um, he takes, um, his depression um, is not that strange. The prefix ontolo suggests that neo-suffering are not so much psychological, but more philosophical. He questions the very distinction between the real and the virtual world. When he meets Morpheus in the closet and swallows the red pill finally, the old scenario seems to play out again. But on a closer inspection, there are here also we see substantive twists. Where Neo develops superhuman skills in the Matrix, this time it doesn't work very well. He does not get the hang on flying, and in the fight scenes he also turns out not to be a match for the therapist, who turns out to be the reincarnation of the architect from the earlier movies. And where, the already liberated uh, and where the already liberated Trinity in the Matrix helped Thomas to escape from the Matrix, in the Matrix Resurrection, Tiffany is chained to her children and her husband, called Chet. Another ironic reference, since it is the slang name for that insults give to successful alpha males who keep their women, women under control. And also the relationship between the people and the machines has changed in comparison to the first three movies. In I.O., the, hide, the hiding place of the people who escaped from the Matrix 8, well, he, well, it's <coughs> I had to say <laughs> something about his name as well. It's a very interesting name again. It's Zion. It is a part of Zion, uh, I.O., it's the two letters. You can read it as input-output, I.O., you can also read it as a one and a zero. It's a binary again here, uh, but it's a kind of poking fun at the binary. It is now the hiding place for the humans. The hiding place for the humans. And there is no longer a war between those machines, uh, at least not between all machines and humanity, because we see that they are friends with some of the machines who decided to join humanity. And there are also software programs that are being materialized. In the language of the film, they are exomorphic particle codecs. 
And so they are software programs that become real. And so here again, between reality and simulation, um, there is a very blurry uh, line. And another interesting thing is when Neo um, get a kind of guided tour through IO, he also see that they produce uh, no longer this disgusting food, but uh, very tasty uh, strawberries. And how are they made? They are made, and I quote from one of the scientists working in IO, they are made from the digital code from the matrix, retro converted into DNA sequences and made into strawberries. So the real world is a product here of the simulation. Or to state it more clearly, I think, or more concisely, uh, sorry, more precisely, the real and the virtual worlds are no longer distinguishable and equally comfortable in a way, or equally uncomfortable. It is for this reason that General Niobe, Neo's former fellow warrior and now leader of IO, prefers cooperation with the machines to war and even imprisons Neo to prevent him from returning to the Matrix to liberate Trinity. Of course, Neo perseveres, but this time not to sacrifice himself for humanity, the grand narrative of the film trilogy, but only to rescue and to unite with Trinity. Just like Niobe, the humans don't want to leave their world. From the conversations between the therapist and Neo, it becomes clear why. The eighth version of the Matrix functioned extremely well. And that's because the people in it live a very comfortable life. And the therapist explains, quietly yearning for what you don't have while dreading losing what you do have. For 99.9% .9 of your race, that is the definition of reality. Desire and fear, baby. The reason that the eighth version of the Matrix is so stable in comparison to the earlier versions is that Neo and Trinity are kept near to each other and unconsciously long for each other. But at the same time, it is prevented that they become too close. And this two-person version of the anomaly produces so much desire and so much energy that both the machines and the humans function well. Like IO, the real and the virtual worlds are functioning in perfect harmony and they are no longer distinguishable. And this is also shown by the way the matrix is represented in the matrix resurrections. The gloomy green glow that characterized the first three movies has disappeared. Now we see uh, sunrises, we see brightful colors, we see even rainbows in the sky. Neo's only goal now is to unite with Trinity. And because this would lead to another crash in the Matrix, the therapist tries to prevent Neo from doing this at all costs. To settle the battle, the therapist, feeling confident in his case, proposes to Neo to make a bet. They will let Trinity choose between her life in the Matrix with her husband and children or a life with Neo outside the Matrix. If she chooses for Neo, he can take her from the Matrix. If she chooses to stay in the Matrix, Neo has to return to the Matrix as well and to his pod, of course, and continue his unfilling, unfulfilling longing for Trinity. Whereas Neo was, in spite of his doubts, the one in the first three movies, the savior of humanity, now it is Tiffany, with the help of her friends, that has become the one and that has to decide. It's no longer Neo's choice, it is her choice. Not only her choice for Neo or staying in the Matrix, but also a choice that will determine the future of humanity. For those of you who haven't seen the film yet, I won't go over the many storylines and subplots and twists here. I do reveal, however, that the Matrix will not be permanently destroyed in the end. And this is in perfect accordance with our own lives. Because 
this is the world which we live, in which we live, and in which we always have lived. Human experience has always been mediated. This is not a new phenomenon created by modern mass media and the internet, but it is a characterization of human experience as such. The way we re uh, experience reality is, first of all, as Immanuel Kant made clear in the 18th century, depending on the way of our senses, our mind, and last but not least, the way our imagination works. Our cognition does not confirm, conform to the objects we, rec we cognize, rather those objects necessarily conform to our innate a priori faculties of cognition. The thing in itself, das ding an sich, in Kant, is unknowable. It's an undefinable X. But in addition to our ability to know, our experience is also guided by the media we have created during the evolution. From the spoken word, the written and printed languages, to the radio, the film, the television, and even virtual reality. And technical instruments like microscopes, telescopes, particle accelerations, DNA synthesizers, they are also media that not so much represent reality, but form it and construct it following, following our imaginations. Kant's idealistic worldview certainly does not mean that we have completely control over reality. No matter how much our fantasy, the mother of all media, often leads us to believe. Reality also acts on us, often works against us, and can even disrupt our world. We only have to think about the corona pandemic or the climate crisis, or the way in which information technologies unintentionally also enable hatred, manipulation, fake news, and injustice. We are the creators of all these media, but we are not the masters of it. They often have their own agenda, full of unexpected and unpredictable side effects. So we inevitably always live in simulated words, worlds. In that sense, Baudrillard uh, is right, just like philosophers like Bostrom. But it should be noted that Baudrillard's philosophy rests on an ontological nostalgia, a desire for a purity of experience that never have existed. The experience of all wars before Gulf War were also mediated by colored observations, by stories, by books, by photos, by films, by paintings, etc. The choice we, as Neo-Kantians in the line of Neo and Trinity, the choice we face is not between the blue and the red pill. Or maybe it's better to say that we should take them both at the same time. So that we both have access to the simulations and realize at the same time that they are just that, simulations. Those who only take the blue pill, like Cypher in the first film, do not realize that they are living in a simulation. Ignorance is bliss, Cypher says. But that ignorance implies that we are trapped in the simulation and are not aware of it. That's not only that uh, when he chooses for the blue pill, uh, it's not only that he lives in a simulation, but also that he forgets to live in a simulation and believes that is the world as it is. Those who only take the red pill think they know the ultimate truth about vaccinations, conspiracies, the climate, the right politics, etc. Blinding and fanaticism, uh, uh, fanaticism then lurks. In both cases, there is a lack of imagination and therefore freedom to change the operating systems that rule our lives, thus preventing us from painting the sky with rainbows as Neo and Trinity do in the final scene of the movie. Imagination gives something to them they never thought they could have. Or as Trinity says before, she and Neo start to redesign the matrix we got another chance. If you mix red and blue, you get purple. When the Wachowski brothers made their first Matrix movie, 
and Warner Bros. banned them from depicting a trans person in the film, the drug Premarin has been on the market for a while already. The purple pill, which contains a dose of estrogen, was often used in male to male to a male to female transgender hormone therapy. It would be more than a decade before the Wachowski brothers dared to take on such a, re a resurrection with a twist and change their gender and transform themselves in trinities. No longer Neos, but trinities. As we saw in the Matrix Resurrections, Neo swallows Onto flocks him to keep him trapped in the existing Matrix. Now that big form have the drug against Corona ready in addition to the vaccines, it is perhaps an idea for them to turn their, um, their business plan and to develop some kind of ontolo premarin, so that we, like Neo and Trinity, can paint the sky with, rain, uh, with rainbows. Thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you so much. So I guess the question isn't, uh, are we living in a simulation? But since when have we been living in a simulation? <laughs> um, I have a question before we go to questions of the, uh, the audience. So where the original Matrix was, as you said, like kind of a critique within the system, uh, the new Matrix is a comedy. So is that the next step? We laugh at the critique and it's just funny now. Is it a little, is it a little cynical? Um, well, it's a happy cynicism, as I, I, I said, in the sense that, um, and, and that's a really Nietzschean kind of idea, when you abandon the idea of a better world, either uh, in the afterworld or another world. Uh, people go on holidays to exotic um, islands, et cetera, to, uh, to find the lost paradise, so to say, or it is projected in the future, uh, the, the, the communist ideal state or uh, the neoliberal fantasy that come true at a certain moment then we are still trapped in a certain sense in a kind of longing that keeps us away from our daily life and from the goals that we can realize in this world. Okay, clear. Mm -hmm. uh, my colleague is here with a microphone, so if anyone wants to ask a question, uh, feel free. And if you want to ask a question from home, drop it in the chat. How does the idea of unexistence or like death, the opposite of reality, just no reality, for example, how would that fit into? So you can can you can you repeat because I maybe also because of the mask I didn't. Sorry, I I was wondering um, because we work off the premise that there is existence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Could we ever reach a point where there is no existence? Aha. Uh -huh. no. um, <laughs> well. <laughs> there is also a um, some scenes in the in the first three movies that refer to Zen Buddhism, for example. There is no spoon. Eh? There is a famous scene from one of the movies. There is no spoon. Um, wh what what is existing? And eh? that's that's an interesting point here. And maybe we can refer to um, to a distinction that has been made, especially in the 20th century in philosophy, between um, two different types of ontology. There is an ontology of things, material things, and in a, in a materialized worldview, that's all there is. And then also humans become a kind of things. Uh, and human existence and just being like a stone, or it's more complex, etc. But philosophers like um, Heidegger, uh, a phenomenologist and existentialist, say, well, humans are not so much made of material, of course, we are also are partly made of material, but we are also made of time. Time, because when we live, we always live with our past. The past that formed us, the past that we have memories of, that also uh, is where we made plans for our life, where we meet people, etc. And we also have anticipations for the future, our plans, our imagination. And um, that's the kind of existence I think the last Matrix movie is also referring to. Uh, it's bending of the rules. And we can make nowadays computer programs that can
compose Bach sonatas or, uh, or that can paint Rembrandt paintings, but they do exactly following the rules and have no freedom to change the rules in that way. And of course, you can, uh, you can also uh, add some uh, randomizer to, to make some changes, but it's always within the system. And human imagination is something which is important. If we lose that, I would say, then maybe we, should, eh, we, we can no longer say that we exist. Because existing is always existing in time. Anyone else? Okay, no, then I have a question. Um, <laughs> if, we, if we talk about existing in time and we talk about the current matrix, if we would have with thought experience, what would the next matrix, if there would be another <laughs> matrix, what would that would be about? <laughs> well, <laughs> I think um, if we follow our imagination, it's time maybe to think about some other stories. Uh, that's also, of course, um, it needed a reboot in the sense that you have uh, have a kind of a completely different world, and to say that's also one of the terms uh, Heidegger uses. A world is not um, the, the total the totality of things like the chairs and the the, the houses and the, and the stars, etc. But a world is also a meaningful whole. Uh, it is the the meanings that we attach to things. And in that sense, you can say the, the medieval worldview was completely different. Everything was made by God, etc. And decide, our life was decided by God. Now we have a, a modern technological kind of view. And also fantasy worlds like The Matrix or other big stories, uh, they create new meaning and can inspire us in our life. And I think for that reason, continuing this it's a very nice story, and of, of course, it's fun again. I've, it was nice to see the fourth movie, especially because you asked me to give a lecture on it. But um, I don't think I will watch the fifth one, if, if there comes one. Uh, again, they said we will, know, we will not make a fifth movie, but they also said it about the fourth one, and they were seduced by, me, eh, by Warner Bros. to actually do it uh, in the final analysis. But Maybe it would be most apt to have one without the Wachowski sisters now and just <laughs> yeah, but still it is a nice uh, like I said in the, in the in uh, ancient Greece and uh, there were festivities the Dionysia and there you have one trilogy of three tragedies that were connected one story and there was for as a kind of relief a comedy at the end now we have it now so now go on to a, a different story I would say sounds good. I see a question. Uh, wait, let, you can wait for the microphone. That's maybe a little bit easier than screaming. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you, Professor. This was a lot of fun. I really enjoy this type of analysis. The last time I went to one about Shrek and the capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> so this one was also a lot of fun. My, my question is, what if we do accept that we live in a simulation? What does it change for our daily life? And should I not pursue a career as an economist anymore? And just enjoy life, or should I should I focus on on, on, on meaning, or mm -hmm. what does it change to, to know about do we live a simulation or not? Well, I what 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 I tried to explain in the in the very last part about the blue uh, taking the blue and the red pill at the same time, maybe as a purple pill or as two separate pills, it has an advantage in the sense that you know you live in a simulation. And that's different from not knowing you're in a simulation. Because if you are not aware that you're in a simulation, you can take it for granted and think that is the world as it is. And also those who only take the blue, uh, the, the red pill, also they think they, ha they know the truth about the world, the final truth. And in both cases, there is no freedom of change in a sense. Because you have to know you're living in a simulated world in order to realize that you can also make another simulation. And to change the system, the system is not given. Uh, um, Margaret Thatcher once said that when, when neoliberalism was the final, the, the final grand narrative that was still existing, and communism went away, Christianity was no longer uh, um, a, a worldview that attracted most of the people in the Western world at least. Uh, um, she said uh, famously about neoliberalism, there is no alternative. 
That's the only way we have. The world, uh, as we, the economic system we have now, that's the final system. Well, if you think that, then you take away also um, the motivation to change. And if we think about uh, the climate crisis, for example, then I think it is uh, clear that uh, there is a need for a change. But you have to believe in it. Huh? So you have to know that the world we have simulated, uh, the, the world we have now, and the kind of production we have now, is not the only opportunity and not the only possibility. Is that an answer to your question? Yeah. yeah. You should actually be spurred to make a change now. <laughs> Anyone else? I see another hand. Um, the movie Don't Look Up is very popular right now. Do you see any connection with it? Yeah, that's an interesting point. Yeah, I also, yeah, yeah there was a, I, I had a lot of ideas when I watched the movie, uh, and but I could only put <laughs> part of it in, in my lecture. And indeed, um, Don't Look Up is, um, is connected to it in the sense that um, exactly shows effect um, what happens when people only take the blue pill, so to say. Um, and they live a comfortable life and they don't want to see the truth, so to say. And so in, in that sense, I think it's a critique of um, uh, looking away from real problems that, that are facing us. Uh, and it is, uh, I also connected the, the, the um, the fake news, etc. That, uh, of course, uh, the, the the movie is. Um, I don't know if if you've seen the movie. It's about a meteorite that is uh, coming to the Earth and will destroy the Earth. And some scientists they have um, uh, they they um, and they uh, they have um, uh, um, tracked this uh, meteorite and they they try to warn the president, but the president only looks at the polls and say, no, we should not alarm the people, etc. And so there's a movement, don't look up. And so then you, you don't see um, the, 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 the thing coming, so to say. And I think it's closely connected. Eh? It's also the red pilling is, in, in a sense, the opposite. It is also b uh, believing in, in that you finally had the truth about the conspiracy or whatever. But that's also a way of not looking at the real problems. Is that the an answer to your question? So. What, what real problems are you trying to deal with? Is that what you're um, <coughs> For the people watching at home. <laughs> it's like you said, uh, do not see the real problems, but then just like Morpheus asked, how do you define real? Um, well, well, when you bump against the wall, <laughs> you experience a real problem, so to say. and. Um, the point is the, the way we experience the world is not um, an, a, a kind of exact copy. Yeah? We always live in a simulation in the sense that we have IDs and media to, um, to get a, a, a picture of the world and to interact with the world. Um, but the world not always completely uh, agrees <laughs> in the sense that it exactly does what we want to do. I think about, um, well, an interesting point also addressed in the movie is um, DNA research and um, also genetic uh, modifications, for example. And now we have this fantastic instrument, um, CRISPR-Cas. Uh, we, 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 we learn to read DNA in the Human Genome Project, etc. And now we can also write DNA. There's a, it's a technique to, uh, in, in, in a relatively easy way to change the order of DNA and to create our own organism, so to say. Well, uh, that's, a, that's a, a great idea, also a very dangerous idea in any respect. And what we see now is that um, it, it, it works. So it, that can, it's a very good simulation, you can say, of reality. And you can actually say that the kind of organisms we created are really simulations, they are copies without an origin, because they are something completely new. But what we also experience now is that this kind of modifications also um, uh, create all kinds of forms of cancer in organisms. And because 
the point is that genes often have many functions in many, uh, in, in many different networks. So if you change it here in order to perform a particular task, it also um, evokes changes in other parts of the organism and has often unintended, uh, unforeseen, uh, unpredictable side effects. And that's a kind, then you are confronted with real and something unexpected. Um, uncontrollable, I would say. And that's also, <laughs> that was the very problem in the matrix that um, in order to make it livable for humans, humans have to have freedom. And that's why at a certain moment, uh, Neo was, yeah, Neo is then the kind of the symbol for it. It's a person who just not only follows the rules, but also is able to bend the rules and to change. But that creates the problems and crashes in the system. And so <laughs> that's, um, yeah. In a way, you can say, as long as this happens, it's also good. It's a wake-up call often and to, to experience that um, life is no fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are. Yeah, you are causing it, or even part of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Agent Smith in the first movie also said about humans: they are a kind of virus, a very <laughs> violent kind of virus that destroys the whole planet. And from an ecological perspective, there's something to say for that, of course. Okay, I think uh, I think that's our time for today. Uh, I want to thank Jos and I want to thank uh, everybody for coming. In two weeks, we'll be talking not about simulations, but about hallucinations, when we have a <laughs> lecture on uh, the psych psychedelics and medical use. So join it if you what, want. What, what kind of pills do you provide then? <laughs> <laughs> I won't provide any. But <laughs> and don't bring any, please. No, uh, thank you very much. I want one big last applause for Jos de Mil. Thank you very much. Thank you.